Whatever we're doing, wherever we're going, it's all about Jesus at all times, amen? And that includes our ladies' retreat that is coming up as well. Uh, a lot of things that we do at Believer's Fellowship, but there's probably most impacting things we do are these retreats, whether it's the pastor's retreats in different parts of the world we do, whether it's the men's retreats and ladies' retreats, youth retreats. These are important times. Just get away from everything else and spend some time with God. Ladies, I hope that you've made plans to be there. If you haven't, I'm sure we can make some more room for you. But the information's out on the table for what you need to bring when the first times uh, start. All that information is vital, and uh, hopefully if you haven't gotten it, you'll pick it up today. But uh, it's going to be a great, great time of the Lord. I want to start today. Many of you know that after the Belize Conference, we are, we're spending to have a little vacation time this year, and that was interrupted by a whole world of things that broke loose. One was my stepfather, who was in uh, very critical condition. So uh, we had about a day. We waited for a flight to open up, and so... We were in Belize on Sunday and Monday after the conference, and then Tuesday we caught a plane to come back. Uh, got off the plane, took our luggage to the house, dumped it out, put some clean stuff in it, and drove for seven hours out to West Texas. Went straight to the hospital when we got there. So it's been a, it's been a unique trip. The doctors, when I met with them, you know, were taking the intubation tube out of him, and he was cognizant, but a lot of drugs and stuff. He's 88 years old, diabetic, failing heart, you know, man of God who should have died 25 years ago. And uh, he just takes a lick and keep on ticking, you know, one of those deals. And it's been interesting to see what happened as we were deciding that he didn't want to do any more of the dialysis and all those other things and resuscitation. He said, I'm ready. Whatever God wants to do is fine with me. Uh, Doctors met with me and my mother out in the hallway and said, well, we might, he might have three days left, a week, maybe a month, most probably, uh, that, uh, you know, take him home so he can be comfortable, so he can pass among family and friends. So we took him home, and he slept for a while, and we set him up, and then we took him some food, and he ate it like he hadn't eaten in six months. Uh, sat on the bed, side of the bed, talked to everybody, got him up the next morning, and Fed him breakfast at the table. He got out where he wasn't supposed to walk. It's been one miracle after another to see how God's just given him strength. And, you know, I sat down and told him what the doctor said. I said, you know, that uh, they tell me that, uh, you know, I should, have, I be, should be prepared to bury you tomorrow. And uh, some might think that's a little bit hard, but I would want to know. And you know how good I am at relaying those kind of things. <clears throat> and I uh, woke him up the next morning and asked him if he's ready for it. Next morning, I said, well, you missed it yesterday. <laughs> I said, you ready to go today? Well, if he calls me, but if not, I'll stick around. And, but I just let him know what the doctors were saying, that, that, you know, so he could do what he needed to do and uh, make plans and accordingly. And it's just been amazing what we've seen God and cognizance and the clarity and, uh, you know, the lucidity that he has and uh, just had some good fellowship and some good times and... Uh, Kathy was getting real ill while we were there. Before we went, she'd been con uh, diagnosed with bronchitis for about a week before we left for Belize, and she seemed to be doing better, and uh, shortness of breath and fluid, you know, kind of building up, and it was really congestive heart failure. Uh, they just misdiagnosed it, because uh, she'd had bronchitis about six months before that. And uh, ended up, uh, she got, we got back, and she was always out of wind, and couldn't walk across the room, but I said, you know, she said, well, I, I said, you need to get back to the doctor immediately. Well, I'll do it Friday, and that was Tuesday. I said, no, today or tomorrow, that's, you know, you're going to have to get back to the doctor and let's take care of whatever's going on. Uh, so she went and had an x-ray, took it to the doctor, and the doctor said, well, you don't have bronchitis. She says, well, you've got to be crazy. I've got pneumonia or something. I can't breathe. Came in immediately back to the doctor, and they called me because she'd gone over to the doctor by herself and said, you come get her. She going to drive herself, take her immediately to the hospital. We went out to St. Luke's at Vintage Park there on 249, and uh, they admitted her through the ER and immediately began to do testing and uh, ultrasounds on the heart and the rest of her body and uh, told her, you know, you've got some major problems here. Your heart is uh, not beating on the upper level. It's just turning up there. It's not really beating. It's doing like 450 to 400 pulses a minute in the, uh, the upper heart chambers. And some of you who actually graduated from junior high know there are four chambers in the heart. And there's two upper and there's two bottom. Well, the, the bottoms were beating at about 150. The top's about 400 plus. Uh, to which we've still not gotten the heart to stop doing that. A lot of things have happened. We've seen a lot of reports. Some of you have been getting the email updates, and you've seen a lot of things have happened. We transferred from Vintage Park down to the Heart Center, St. Luke's there. Uh, I think that was the best place for us to go since they're the experts in the field, in, in, the, in the world, in, in this particular area. Several specialists are working with us there. 
Uh, first couple of days, we wouldn't let her eat. Maybe have a little clear liquids and some broth. But uh, so the first three days, she wasn't able to eat because of all the testing they had to do. Some of the first testings, you, uh, I'm just kind of summarizing a whole world of events that have gone on. But uh, uh, when we got there, some of the first testings they did down there were to uh, obviously do some more ultrasounds, some x-rays, some MRIs, and EEGs, and ECGs, and EKGs, and ABCDs, and all the other alphabets they throw out there and expect me to know what it means. But uh, they diagnosed, while we were at the Vintage Park St. Luke's, that she had a bad valve, and it was just kind of fluttering, and the bloods were seeping back, and especially with a heart churning like that, what it'll do is just turn the blood to butter. And uh, they were afraid of clotting, which would immediately mean, you know, that clot would break loose and go somewhere to be death. And so uh, they sent us very carefully to the other hospital when they diagnosed that. Plus, they also said she was complaining about some other pains. They, all, they, they did some... Uh, some ultrasounds and said, that, you know, we see you have an inflamed uh, and an infected uh, gall, uh, gallbladder. And so uh, we don't know how this is going to work. You may have two surgeries at once. You may have to do one first. And you may have to do open heart on the other if the valve is not, you know, can't be repaired from some other avenue. And just, you know, you be ready for whatever the prognosis are. And then we sent out the emails again. Uh, we got over to St. Luke's at the medical center. They did a nuclear test on the, on the gallbladder came back and said, you know, we saw what they saw. We saw their ultrasounds, but we're seeing something different now. Uh, there's no inflammation. There's no gallstones. There's no nothing wrong with your, your gallbladder. And so that was a hallelujah. And they were scratching their head. We, we just must have misdiagnosed that. And I said, well, probably not, but I have another doctor working on our case. Amen. Amen. The biggest concern at this point has been the arrhythmia of the heart and the upper heart chamber just being out of sync. One of the first things they wanted to do after doing the nuclear test, the same morning they took her back for another test where they run a uh, scope down your throat into your heart. And it goes right down. It's got a 360 camera in it that looks on every angle. And they said, well, we got, they came back with a report from that. While they were there, they tried to send an electric probe down to the upper chamber of the heart. And maybe you've heard of atrial fibrillation before they'll shock the heart, try to get it back in rhythm. And they did shock it. It went back into rhythm for a moment, or maybe a minute, and then went back to doing the crazy thing. So that didn't work in that regard. And they were hoping that would work to get the heart back into the way it's supposed to be sinking. Basically, it says she has a very, very sick heart. We think something must have happened somewhere. We think she had uh, uh, some kind of rheumatic fever at some point in her life. She says, I've never had rheumatic fever. She said, if you have all the symptoms of somebody who's had rheumatic fever, maybe you just didn't know you had rheumatic fever, whatever it might have been, but this is where, where we're at in all this. Uh, the scope came back and revealed that there were two leaks and not one, but it wasn't uh, a bad picture. The original ultrasounds, it said she had a leak. It's backwashing. The blood is standing in the back of her heart. Heart's enlarged. The heart is enlarged. But instead of one leak that's just severe, and he was acting like the valve would just be fluttering there, he said that's not what we saw when we actually put the scope down. Uh, we, our diagnosis has changed again. Uh, it's not one valve, it's two valves, but it's moderate, and people live all the time with that. It's, it's you know, it's, we all, a lot of people have leaky hearts and don't know about it. I, I, mean, I got lots of leaks everywhere, and I don't probably know about most of them. But that, uh, you know, they didn't think that that would require an open heart surgery, maybe some non-invasive kind of thing, like orthoscopic through one of the ribs, uh, if it needed it at all. They said, that's, that's not really our biggest concern anymore. The biggest concern is getting this heart in its God-given rhythm. And uh, they brought in a couple more specialists. We had two more specialists that came in. Uh, one of them is working with her, started yesterday in regard to a particular medicine. Uh, it's taken in three doses, 12 hours apart. And this particular medicine is, has to be watched over with constant EEGs and everything else because it's such a radical treatment that uh, it's supposed to put the heart back in rhythm. He said, you won't know by the first dose. By the second, we might know if it's going to work or not, but by the third, you know for sure. Said I give it a six in ten chance of working to get the heart back in rhythm. So uh, we said, well, we don't go by chances. We're going to see what God does. And uh, so we appreciate your prayers in that. Today at six in the morning, she had her second dose of that. She'll have another one at six tonight. And uh, they monitor the whole process and keep an eye on it in that regard. Her heart is still beating at 400 something beats a minute in the upper part. Uh, after the first treatment, the bottom section beats anywhere from 100 to 150 beats per minute. Her heart rate is normally about 62. She's, you know, always kidding about living forever because she had such a chabump. Like her heart was saying, about, okay, okay, but bump again, you know. But 
just been steady. But uh, this was like, it was as big a surprise to her as it was to, to everybody else that the, what was going on with her. Uh, I know that uh, many of you want to go up and see her, and I appreciate you not coming. Kathy is a people person. Those of you who know her know that. She loves you more than you can imagine. Uh, to give you an illustration, the few people that have been able to see her snuck by me and the security and everybody else and walked in the room and surprised me, like Jennifer. You know, she walks in with her badge on so, you know, and her gun, so nobody's going to stop her. You know? But thank the Lord for coming in a lot. But she'll witness to you the fact that when she was there, she watched the heart monitor, and she's jumping up from a 95 beach to 135 beach just seeing Jennifer come in the door. You know, she, she just loves people, and she loves you. And so we've asked that, you know, we just don't have that kind of visitation at this moment, especially today, they're saying, and as they're doing this three-pill medication thing, uh, they, they kind of keep her as calm as possible. A lot of it depends on keeping the heart rate at a steady rate. They took her off a, a medicine that was running that lower heart down to 80 to 90 beats a minute so that they could administer the first pill last night. Uh, when that didn't work, they said, we need to put you back on that medicine. We didn't want both in your system at the same time, but so they're going to be paying extra special attention to her today as they give that particular medication. Uh, prognosis from there, diagnosis and all those things are just one day at a time. They just, we're just taking a step at a time to see what can be done. Monday, uh, they're going to scope from the other side of the heart. And some of you who had stents and those kind of things, and they go in through the, the groin and they scope out the bottom of the heart. And they look at those two chambers. And when they look at those particular chambers, they're looking, first of all, is there any blockages that's built up because of this? And if there are, then they'll probably do an open heart and just try to get to everything that's going on. One of the doctors this morning uh, said that he thinks there may be something in the back of the heart that they cannot see. They just can't see it from everything they've done and the views they've taken that is stimulating the problem. Uh, it's a matter of just wait and see. So we'll try this particular medication. Monday morning, they'll go up with the scope. They'll even attempt to, if we haven't got rhythm back to the heart, a uh, radiophysiologist will come in, run through that same catheter up the groin to the heart, uh, and go in there and place a little probe, make an incision in the heart between the two lower parts, place a probe in there, heat it up, that basically creates a short circuit in the heart, which restarts everything. It's kind of like hitting the breaker switch and turning it back on, chink, chink, you know, and hope that it brings it back to rhythm at that point. Uh, they haven't given us any other indication of any other thing if that doesn't work at this point in time. It's been each day at a time. Let's do what we can. I appreciate your prayers. Kathy said, please, please, please tell the church I appreciate my prayers, which is one of the reasons I'm here. Some of you are wondering what I'm doing here. I have not pretty much left her side at all. Last night I came home for several hours, about six hours of sleep. The night before we got about, about three and a half. The night before we got 45 minutes. So uh, if I'm a little weird this morning... Uh, I'm not even sure I'm here if I'm dreaming, okay? But uh, I appreciate your prayer. She said, you need to be there Sunday just to give an update and uh, to share, you know, my love for the church and their, uh, their prayers for me. Uh, we've gotten a lot of emails, we've gotten a lot of texts. I, I can only say thank God that I have paid for unlimited texting <laughs> or I would be broke. And it would be your fault, and we'd have to take an offering. Amen. But praise the Lord for unlimited texting. Because she doesn't have it, so don't text her phone. <laughs> text me if you want to say something. Send an email to Kathy at BF Church, Pastor Joe at BFChurch.com, you know, either one of those. Uh, send, some of you sent a prayer that you prayed for her. I would read those to her. Many of you I didn't get back. Thursday morning, when everybody began to find out what's going on, I got 100-plus emails and texts all in about three miles' time. Uh, it was great. I, I was stupid enough to try to answer those in the beginning. How's she doing? And I know it's frustrating for you. When, when, when I walk in the church, as it was this morning at the other camp, people say, how's she doing? And I don't answer you, all right? Uh, you can only answer that question so many times without breaking up yourself. So I'm just kind of, if I put you off for a minute, I'll make an announcement to everybody or I'll send an update. Uh, there's only so much the mind can comprehend in one moment of time. And as much as I'd like to think, or we'd all like to think we're Superman or Superwoman, we are not. And God has a way of showing us that occasionally. Amen? Amen. But your texts have been read to her. Your prayers have been read to her. When you send a scripture, uh, please type it out so I don't have to look it up. It makes it much easier. All right? Some of you think, I know some of you think I've memorized the whole Bible. 
I'm only halfway through. <laughs> but uh, it takes, you know, I, I do, it, it encourages her, it blesses her. Uh, it's, been, it's been an interesting time in the hospital as we've had the opportunity to minister a lot of people. Uh, Thursday night, 1 o'clock in the morning, nurses stations, a couple of male nurses out there, and they're going at it. They're doing everything from talking about their feelings to uh, politics to religion to God and everything else. And finally, a nurse was in the room doing it because you know how it is. And she's in intensive care. And they're in the room every five minutes. You really can't sleep. Even if you had a bed there, which I don't, they gave me a chair. So it's, it's you know, they don't give you a lot of privacy. But I finally just started saying, yeah, I said, ma'am, you know, I said, uh, thank you guys for all you're doing. But those guys are going to have to shut up. I said, why don't you just reach out the window and say, there's a Baptist preacher in here. Don't make him come out there. <laughs> so, so. She told him, there's a Baptist preacher in here. He's going to come straighten you guys out in your theology and your philosophy. Where? And one comes in, and 1230 in the morning, 1 o'clock almost. We had five nurses in the room, shaking hands, introducing themselves, talking to Sister Kathy, praying over Sister Kathy. You're the first lady. We're going to take care of you, ma'am. You're going to, you know, and so then they stuck around for another hour while I got the opportunity to have a little service. And, uh, but there's been so many opportunities to minister to people and reach out to people. And uh, in the midst of your crisis, it's amazing how God opens yeah. that door for other people in crisis. You know, you can, you can comfort others with the comfort you're being comforted with. So pray for us and pray for Kathy to learn how to not talk for a couple of days. She has the gift of fellowship, you know that. You've seen me waiting around between services trying to get her in the car perhaps, you know, I've got to get to the next place. So uh, she loves you, she thanks God for your prayers. Right now where we're at Monday, they'll do this other catheter. We just need you to pray that God just get the heart back in rhythm, Amen. you know, and then begin to heal that upper chamber. It's very swollen. Uh, and the doctor said that part of her heart's very sick. So let's just begin to pray in that regard, your prayers in these other areas. It's amazing what God's done, how we've seen prayers answered. Pray for these doctors to have wisdom beyond their education, their training, that the Holy Ghost wisdom will come upon them along with the nurses and technicians. Pray especially that they have patience with me. Because I want answers and I want them now. <laughs> Amen, don't we all? But praise the Lord. Ultimately, this is a God thing in, in our hands. Praise the Lord that uh, she didn't have this happen in Belize. You know, I'd probably be bringing her home in a box in that regard. I'll show you how bad medicine is in Belize. You have a big problem, they send you to Mexico. Does that answer the question? <laughs> so praise the Lord that we're where we are and uh, surrounded by people that love us and care for us. And um, I told Kathy, I said, you know, today I'm preaching a, a message that the Lord gave me to preach, you know, back a week and a half ago for this particular Sunday. I, said that I had no idea what kind of preparation he was going to throw me into in preaching and in sharing that message. And I really, it's more of a, just something from my heart this morning out of the book of Genesis chapter 3 and chapter 4 that uh, the Lord has laid on my heart. And basically the title of the message is called Desperation, the Pathway to Believability. And I'll explain that title in, in just a moment, what I mean by the pathway to believability. Because are, are these lights up or am I getting older by the moment? Are they all the way up? Ah, you know, I, I thought I was going blind too. I mean, but anyway, LR's home, Amen. praising the Lord, day by day. We had church while I was out there last Sunday, had about a dozen people in the service in the living room. And uh, praise the Lord, Kathy is there praising the Lord and rejoicing and worshiping. Uh, her faith is unbelievable at this point in time. She's rejoicing, and I'm crying like a two-year-old. So pray for us all, Amen. But in the context of this message, I really didn't know what God was, uh, you know, he was preparing me for. Isn't that the way he does it in our lives, though? He prepares us for things so that when they happen. And this is that point in the Bible, you know, in the fir er, first book of the Bible, and God's made promises to Abraham about a covenant. The children of Israel have gone into bondage to the Egyptians for hundreds of years, and Moses has uh, tried his best to do something about it. He went out to deliver the children of Israel at least one by one and killed an Egyptian. Remember the story? Then he buried that Egyptian in the sand. Now the lesson from that part of the Bible is, if you kill somebody, don't bury him in sand. <laughs> because the wind blows and the rain comes and the sand washes away very easy. Understand my hunger, please, and we may edit that part out of the video later. But <laughs> Beware, your sin will find you out. He's ejected 
No longer does he live in the palace. No longer is he Pharaoh's favorite boy. He's ejected. He's sent out. He's in the desert for 40 years as a shepherd. No purpose in his life, just raising sheep. And we've talked about how stupid they are, amen, and dealing with that. And all he has in his life is these sheep, his little family, and his rod that he shepherds his sheep with. The Lord appears to him in the burning bush in, in chapter 3. And I'll show you some verses in a moment. But I didn't put this in there. So if you do have your Bible, just open quickly to chapters 3 and 4. So we'll kind of bounce through some of that this morning. And I'll just have some of the chapter 4 verses up in a moment. But in, Moses, in Exodus chapter 3, and not Genesis, excuse me, Genesis, Exodus chapter 3, uh, Moses said to God, I'm going to, to, to the sons of Israel, and I want you to go. And, and Moses said, I'm going to go, and I'm going to tell them that the God of your fathers has sent me. And they're going to ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am, he said. And thus shall you say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent you. Now remember, he's at the burning bush. God's telling him what he wants to do. He's standing there. This bush is on fire and it's not being consumed. He's gone up to him and the voice of God is speaking in this, this fire that's that it's not consuming this bush. And, and is, you know, I heard a sermon one time, you know, will you, will you be God's bush? You know, can you let God burn in you and uh, bring life out of you and his word from you? But he's standing there and God's told him what to do. And he says, okay, I, I'll do that. I'll concede. But they're going to ask me when I get there, by what authority are you here? Who, who sent you? Good question, amen. And he said, I want you to tell them that I am sent you. And I love it because first of all, he says, I, I am that I am. Now, what does that mean? God, mean? God is saying that he's God and there's no other God and he, that he doesn't need anything to make him God. He's God all by himself. He, he doesn't have to have anything or anybody or nothing else to be God. He's just the all-sufficient God. He is. He's my light. He's my joy. He's my victory. He's everything I need. He's everything you need. He's our strength. He's our power. He's our witness. Every, everything we'll ever need. And this is what God is basically, I believe, saying to Moses. You've got a task in front of you. It's incredible. It's impossible. Three plus million Jews are going to be led from one place to another. How are we going to let Pharaoh let him? I mean, it's a big deal. How, it's a monumental, impossible task. But I want you to know. It's Philippians 4, he which began a good work in you, he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So no matter what you're facing, no matter what I'm facing, no matter how impossible it sounds, I am sent us. He'll give us what we need. He'll give us what we need when we need. He'll give it the amount that we need. I am sent us. I am sends us. I am is our authority. I am is our life. We can't say that. Even Paul said in, I believe it was in Galatians, Corinthians, when he wrote them, he said, you know, I am what I am by the grace of God. He didn't say, I am that I am. I am what I am. And that's all we'll ever, if we'll ever be anything, that's all we can say. If I ever succeed at anything, that's all I'll really be able to say. And too many people never discover that. They never discover the sufficiency of God in their life. And even though God is committed to us, and we'll see that in a moment, they still don't discover it because of their hardness of their heart and their unwillingness to be obedient to whatever God wants them to do. And then God begins to give him further instructions about what he's supposed to do and what he's supposed to do. And in chapter 4, uh, verse 1, it says, Then Moses answered them, the Lord and said, What if they don't believe me? And what if they don't listen to what I'm telling them? For they may just say, get out of here. The Lord's not appeared to you. God's not for us. We've been in bondage. God's lost all memory of us. He's, he's forgotten about us. God's not on you. God's not with you. God hadn't sent you. You know, it's, it's a good response for Moses here. What if they say this, Lord? In other words, like I said in this sermon titled, what is believable about our lives? What is it about us that makes people say, Man, there's no, there's no reason for their existence, their life, their fullness, their joy other than God. Everything else in the world is opposed to everything that's going on in their life right now, and they're still walking in power. You know, it's got to be God. What, what is it that when people have their own crisis draws them to us because they see in us an answer or a solution or reality or the presence of God on our life? What if they say, Lord, the Lord had to, there's, you, don't anything, you don't know anything about God. What if they say that? What makes us believable? What, makes, what gives us any kind of spiritual magnetism about our life that makes us, that people would want to even say to us, what is it about my life? We were praying in our, in our, in our men's prayer meeting at the other campus this morning, and uh, I prayed something like this, and the Lord just struck my heart and mind with it. I simply prayed, Lord, you know, 
We just pray for your presence to be manifest in this place. And it's like the, the Spirit of God, you know, just kind of struck my heart as I was praying. Lord, we just want you to show up and be in mighty in this place. And that when people walk out of this place, they'll know that they've met with you. But then, and I prayed that almost every Sunday. But the Lord just added something to it this Sunday. He said, pray this. Pray that I so manifest myself to them that when they, I am there, they know it. But when they leave it, others know it. When they walk out into the world, people can see me on their life. They become believable. Too many people are out there spouting Bible verses and don't seem to have much credibility or believability about their life. And this is exactly his particular fear. In fact, he, he levels a couple of objections. And you go down to chapter 4 a little later on, he says, well, I'm not eloquent. And how many of us live with this kind of fear? Well, what if, what if they don't believe what I'm saying? And what if they, you know reject my authority and reject my call. And the Lord said to him, what's in your hand? And he said, a staff. He didn't answer the objection the way he wanted it. He didn't say, well, you don't have to worry about that. I'm going to do signs and wonders. or You know, they're going to know. And, and he did do the, he did, you know, their, the commitment from God was there. He did all these things. But the Lord said, what's in your hand? And I think that's the same thing that the Lord says to us. When we say, Lord, I just really want you on so much on my life that not only do I know it, but my children know it, and my wife knows it, and the community around me knows it, and the church I serve in knows it, and the, the people I work with, they know it. And I think the message is the same. Even though we may not have this great insurmountable task of three million Jews being delivered across the, the desert, ultimately 40 years wandering in the wilderness, taking them in the, to the promised land, ultimately, how are we going to know that God's with us? And I asked the morning the same question, what's in our hand? And I believe as Christians, we have to answer this question more than once in our lives. There's been times in different areas of my life and the testimony of my life where there's, just this, there's come this moment where the Lord just speaks to your heart and it's a moment of desperation where you're saying, I, I don't think I can deal with this. Or, I don't think I can handle this. And I appreciate, and you may be here this morning, and I've even said something like this before to others, but it wasn't accurate when I read it, and I, it really came to me at that point because we, we say stuff like this. Uh, the Lord will never put more on you or on your plate than you can handle. And that's not necessarily true. In fact, that we should finish it. The Lord never puts more on your plate than, than you can handle. We ought to be saying the Lord will put everything on your plate you can't handle, but he'll handle it for you. And I think we understand what, the, what was being said, that we understand that with him, you know, all things are possible. Face to face with God, Scripture says nothing is impossible. But there is that point we have to get to of desperation. We're just saying, Lord... And, and it comes, and I think, in stages wherever we're walking, whatever our life is, and some of you have been knowing the Lord, have some maturity in your spiritual life. You, I don't have to explain much here because you know what I'm saying. There's just different places and valleys and situations that you come to in your life. And one of the glorious things about pastoring this church the last 24 years, I have witnessed many of you walk through that, some valley of shadow of death in some fashion or some form. And I've seen you just get to that point and say, Pastor, I don't know what to do. And I say, I don't know what to do either. But we know who does. Jehoshaphat received the word that the nation, the city was surrounded by every enemy they had. They'd come in concert together to destroy him. He rips his robe and says, Lord, we don't know what to do. But our eyes on you. What's in your hand? And it's interesting. He said, a staff. I mean, by the way, that's what I do. This represents who I am. I'm a shepherd. This, what you see here, is a symbol of my life. And, you know, what I've done for 40 years. It's, uh, it's my, my, my livelihood. It's my, it's my craft. It's, my, it's, it's everything that represents me. And what I've become in 40 years is, is, is a shepherd. He says, Lord, there's a staff in my hand. And the Lord said, throw it on the ground. What? Throw it on the ground. Now, this is the Joe Armour's translation, all right? the, the, the KGV, the King, you know, the, uh, the Ken Joe, not King Joe, Ken Joe, I'm your brother, Ken Joe translation version. And I, I, I really can see this in my, in, my, in my mind because it reads real fast when he says, it be, you know, it says, here's, what I, here's what I mean by it reads real fast. He threw it on the ground and it became a serpent and Moses fled from it. Now, can't you see that in your mind? It's just a staff, throw it down throw it down, a snake! 
Now, I can relate to these few words. Moses fled from it. I'm not much on fellowshipping with snakes. Tim Ellis does. I have a brother-in-law that does. He's got a nine-foot snake in his house. You know, he's got a boa that just recently passed. It was the love of his life he'd had for 15 years. Uh, you know, I remember when his daughter was about one year old, he sent me a picture from Switzerland of his daughter sitting on the snake. You know, the thing was like 12, 14 feet long, about that big around. She's just sitting on the snake. I think, there's something wrong with you, sir. <laughs> he calls the snake a lumpy because when it eats these whole animals he feeds it, there's just lumps up and down his body. So anyway, I'm not into snakes. I'm not a snake kind of guy. I shoot snakes. I don't play with them. And it, he fled from it. Now, I don't know how far he gets, but I said, this reads fast because, you know, it says Moses fled from it. And then you see the next verse, and the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand and grasp it by its tail. So he stretched out his hand and caught it, became a staff again. But, I mean, catch the flow of this. Throw it down, ah, throw it down, snake, gone. And the Lord says, now, is the Lord speaking to him while he's running? All right, and he doesn't have to go very far to pick the snake up, so maybe the snake's following. <laughs> I'm running faster. But isn't that the way we do with God, though? Do this, I don't think so, I'm out of here. He ran because of fear. So many times when God speaks to us, especially about something in our, our life that we don't want to let go of, some issue that we're facing we don't want to deal with, some surrender of our life that we're really not wanting to bring into to whole obedience, we just kind of out of fear go the other direction. And the Lord's voice still comes. He's faithful. And what I want you to see from this pastor, two things. One, God is committed to you. And number two is, not only is God committed to you, God is committed to making you what you need to be. So you can do what you're supposed to do. Let me put it this way. God's committed to you, number one. Number two, God's committed to make you usable. Not only is he going to give you something to do, he's going to do something in you so that you can do what you need to do. Because he never really intended it for us to do anything without him. Jesus said it. Without me, you can do nothing. And I, you know, and I say in, in the context of this passage of desperation, just from a personal point, you know, there's been a, a lot of emotions that have gone on in my own heart and life that I've, you know, walked with and just gone to the back room somewhere and just spent time with God and sometimes just crying. You know, here's a situation that the doctors are not even sure what to do with or where does it lead if they can't do it. And all those things that go through our head, all those things that go through our mind. I mean, we're human. We, we tend to just think of every fear possible. And finally, even the other night when I went home and I was able to spend about three hours there uh, with Kathy to about four o'clock in the morning. And then when she was settled in and rest, I slipped out and went to the house and got some stuff for her and some, took a shower and laid down for a couple hours uh, just laying on the bed crying. Didn't know what to say. I said, God, I, I don't even know what to pray. How many of you have ever been those kind of, you know, most all of us at some point, whether it's that kind of degree or some other kind of degree, we just don't, we just, I don't know how to pray with this. And then this I was just, you know, just sobbing before the Lord. A verse, the Spirit of God just quickened a verse in my heart from Romans 8. says, you know, that when we do not know what to pray, that the Holy Spirit will pray through us with groanings that can't even be uttered. And that's literally what was going on in my spirit. They were just groaning before God. Then after that, there just kind of came an offering of the gratitude, Lord, that thank you, you love me that much. That when even I can't voice to you, that you care enough about us to do that for us, and we miss that context of our Christian life, the nearness of our Father, the commitment that He's made to us, the love that He wants to demonstrate to us. And it gets to the place, if we're going to experience that, I think it's that desperation is the doorway, you know, of just saying, Lord, I, there's nothing I can do here. And I know I'm not speaking to people who haven't experienced this, because I know so many of you. But I do believe we come to it in stages sometimes. And there's areas where God will... Do, there was a time I, I remember very clearly where the Lord just said, you know, I'd been in ministry for years. The Lord said, you have to, you know, somewhere you've taken that rod up and, it's, you know, it's not my rod anymore. And I've just had to throw it back down. At times with my children, just throw it on the altar. You know, they're your God. They're, they're, they're your children. 
And it says that, you know, that, that, that and here's the, the, the thing about this story is that when the, if our, the rod represented Moses' life, everything it was, and, and it, for us it represents our lives, and it means literally to throw our life down before God. And what happens when we do? Well, Moses saw that that rod without God had a snake in it. And so does our life. The serpent represents all that's ungodly and all that's selfish and all that's proud and all that's arrogant, you know? And God has no room for that in our lives. We, we have to be abandoned to him. And we throw down that, that rod before him. And here's the thing. God says, you know, at this point, God says to him, take it back up. And then, then follow the scriptures down into Exodus and forward and follow the story all the way through. You see miraculous things that begin to happen. And no longer as you follow the story later on, it calls it the rod of God. And now you see when Moses picks it up, God deals the snake factor, all right? The sin issue, the selfish issue, the pride issue has to be dealt with. And now it's God's rod. It's in, it's in Moses' hand. God told him to pick it up. He has it, but he picks it up not by the head. I don't know if somebody tells you to pick up a snake, where are you going? Front or, front or back? I'm going to the front, amen? That's the business end. <laughs> That's operational headquarters down at the front. I want to get my hand around that so I can't get bit. The last thing I want to do is pick it up by the tail. Because if I pick it up by the tail, we all know what's going to happen. That thing's going to turn around and bite you. Too many people made that commitment to God, but they picked the rod up by the wrong end. They're still trying to run their life, and it's still a snake. I think of Jacob in the Old Testament. His name meant twister and schemer, always trying to manipulate his way out of another bad deal, manipulate his way out of a bad situation. You know, if something came up, that's all right, I can deal with it. I'll, you know, I'll hire a lawyer, or I'll get this, or I'll, I'll, hire, I'll, I'll get professionals to take care of it, or, or I'll, I'll uh, lie, cheat, and steal whatever it is I, to get my way. And you watch Jacob's life, he's always doing that until God gets him and, and, and meets him at Bethel, and he gets before God and gets desperate before God. And God changes his name there. And every one of us has that Jacob syndrome in us. It's called the old man, all right? We have that serpent it still holds on, and we must abandon our life to God. You follow the story through. You see him go back before Pharaoh. He throws the rod of God down before Pharaoh. It becomes a snake again, and what happens? Well, they bring in the magicians, and they throw down their rods, and what do they become? They become snakes. It's a counterfeit miracle. And to prove the might of God in it, the rod of God that was the snake just ran around and swallowed up all the other snakes. Now who's in charge? <laughs> God's rod. God's in charge. You see him at the Red Sea with it. You see it later on when his authority is being questioned, and that rod buds and brings forth fruit. You see it placed later in the Ark of the Covenant. But all the time you see it being called the rod of God. At the Red Sea, when they're backed up, there's no place they can get out. There's no place they can go. Everything looks hopeless. The Egyptians they thought were, behind, were way behind them now are showing up in the rearview mirror. As they look over their shoulder, it looks like death. The people begin to murmur and complain. Moses is over there say, God, I got a problem. What's that in your hand? Oh, it's the rod. I love what James Darby told the pastors at the pastor's conference. He said, it's time that we stop telling God about our problems and start telling our problems about our God. And that's basically what the God is telling Moses. Go stand in the Red Sea and raise that up. And he raises that rod and that thing splits wide open and they go across on dry ground. And when the Egyptians try to follow them, they're all drowned in the Red Sea. There's no answer in the situations of our life at times until we get a little quiet. And if our life's been abandoned to God, God will give peace, direction, and grace. And even when we don't understand it all, and maybe something happens that we don't like, I sat down with a man yesterday and I said, and, and excuse me for the vernacular, Kathy hates it when I say this word. I don't use this word. It was something in a whole lot different generation. But I just said, sir, I want you to know life sucks. It's, it is horrible. There are terrible things that happen. We live in a world plagued by sin. God of this world, the devil is rampant everywhere. It's horrible. Things are difficult. And your only recourse in that's moments of desperation is to throw everything before God because God is greater than all these things. And no matter what happens, God will work it for your good. You say, but what if something bad happens, Pastor? God will still work it for our good. I've watched some of your lives and seen the testimony of your lives and what's come out of loss and difficulty and seen the ministry that's been developed in hearts and lives and the lives that you've impacted when you went through your desperate time and what God did as a result. 
You'll never really know the full impact of it, ladies and gentlemen, until you stand before God one day. And I believe as we get into heaven, according to what the Bible says in Matthew, that people will be coming up to us and saying thank you, the Scripture says, for us being faithful stewards of what God put on our hands. I believe there's going to be a times throughout all of eternity where people are going to come and run up to you in heaven. They're going to, you're going to cross paths where you're going with somebody. And because God's given you a supernatural divine wisdom at that point, you'll be able to see somebody you never knew, had any idea who they were, and you say, you know, that person had a part in my salvation. And you're going to walk up to them, or they're going to come up to you, and they're going to say, I know what you went through was hard, but what came out of that, you never saw. You never saw it. But you need to know that I was affected. I may have been two years down the road from that event in your life, but because what God did in that, in this person, or you, and that happened to, to, in your life, and your influence affected that person, and that it touched somebody else's life, and somebody else's life, and 14 lines down the road, I was there, and God touched my life as a result of what, if you'd never gone through what you went through, I wouldn't be here today. It's like throwing a, a stone into a pond, and you just get the ripple effect. You may never see the last ripple out there of your life. But if you're living it for Jesus and you're living an abandoned life, you're going to have a fun time in heaven. I don't want to be the guy in heaven nobody's talking to. <laughs> Amen? Because I wasn't faithful or I wasn't desperate. We all have to come to that place and I think it's like I say, it's not just once in our spiritual lives. There are places that God brings us to where we just experience an abandonment to the Lord Jesus. And here's what he says. Why'd I ask you about that rod in your hand? Why'd we go through this? So that they believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Isn't it interesting that what God says in this moment, how will they, how will, what's the, what makes me believable? What's in your hand? What are you holding back? What's so important to you? You can't surrender to God at this point in your life. Some of you may have never even given your life to Christ. And what you're holding is in your, your whole life. 1973, I threw down the rod of Joe Arms, basically. I threw down my life before the Lord. I had no idea what was in store. None of us do. Amen? But I've discovered God's faithful. And you've discovered God is faithful, those you've made that commitment of your heart and your life. And even when you've been unfaithful and you've been rebellious, he's been faithful to woo you back and break your heart and bring you to a place of new, fresh love and joy in life. Throw it down. Your life without God is not a life at all. I don't care what you achieve, what you receive in life. You're just a hunk of warm meat walking around if you don't have God in your life. Christ is not your Lord and Savior. And if you are a believer, you're going to come to these places in your life where life is hard. It's hard. I'll shoot you later. <laughs> it's the devil calling, trying to tell you it's not hard. Don't answer it. It gets difficult. But God is faithful. His mercies are new every morning. And I believe that if we could come to the place to say, Lord, here it is. Whatever it might be for you today. I know what it is for me. Let's throw it down. Let's lay it on the altar. God may let you take it back up. He may not. That's his business. But whatever it is, God is sovereign and has made sure that all things work together for good. We don't, might not even see the good in it. May all we can see is the sorrow, the hard times, a difficulty, a crisis. But one day in eternity when we stand before God, we're going to just be in so much awe because we're going to see all the things we don't see. We're going to know all the things we don't know. And we're going to just, I don't think there's going to be anything we do. It fall down to God's face and say, you're right. You're always, you were always right. It was always right and righteous and just and perfect. Look what you did as a result of that. It was worth every bit of it, Lord Jesus. It may be hard for us to say that right now. But one day you will. Even if you don't get to say it in this lifetime, you will.
because God's faithful. Would you stand?